All right, yeah, it's a pleasure, and thank you, Kenny, for organising this. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the field of ancient DNA today. And whenever I say ancient DNA, all people think about is Jurassic Park um, and uh, getting DNA out of, out, of, out of dinosaur fossils. I'm really sorry to disappoint you today if I'm, going to talk, I'm not going to talk about dinosaurs. Some of the oldest DNA we've managed to recover, um, heads, it's back in the era of about sort of two to three million years old. After that, these, these molecules get smashed up into tiny little pieces and we can't meaningfully put together um, meaningful genetic sequences when we've got single pieces of DNA. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I, dinosaurs tend to follow me around as a career. The two, my t the two hats that I wear in the lab at the moment, I work on ancient DNA and I work on environmental DNA. And environmental <laughs> DNA is getting uh, DNA out of, out of water column. And um, environmental DNA has hit the headlines as well recently because people are going into Loch Ness looking for plesiosaur DNA by scooping water up and trying to get traces of its uh, DNA. So I can't get away from that. This is our, um, our clean lab at Curtin University, the, the trace facility. And we get dressed up in body suits when we go in there doing ancient DNA work, not because we're scared of the samples. They've been dead for thousands of years, but we're trying not to contaminate them with, with, with uh, what you ate for lunch, human DNA, or indeed any environmental sample that's kicking around um, in the environment. Um, so this is a 400 square meter clean room, it's got lots of HEPA filters and these are clean labs within clean labs. And we try and do that to, to stop um, invalidating all our results, which is kind of where Jurassic Park came from. Right, I come from New Zealand, if you haven't been there it's just kind of like Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> but instead of lots of orcs kicking around in New Zealand, there were lots of uh, these mega herbivorous birds called moa, and I've studied these for many years. Um, and we go into museum collections and we um, ask permissions to cut holes in bones. Everyone goes, oh, there's a big hole in that bone. There were so many moa bones collected in New Zealand and they came out of all the swamps that when they, and the museum couldn't do with them, so when they built the new wing of the museum, they used them as infill um, to fill up the, the foundations of them, which will probably freak some people out. Um, but anyway, that, that's how many moa bones there are, so cutting a few holes in them isn't going to break it. I've been working on taxonomy of, of moa for many years. This guy here needs a taxonomic lesson because he's put his mower together with four legs and twice as many vertebrae to make a giraffe. <laughs> um, anyway, so th there are some major problems uh, with, with uh, the taxonomy and there's been about 80 different names given to this group of birds that were in New Zealand. Um, when I was working in the UK, we were working on these two species. Uh, when we started pulling DNA out, it turns that these were the girls and these were the boys and they weren't different species, they were just different sexes. And here's a pigeon down here for scale. Um, and that's a, you know, quite an extreme example of, of reverse sexual dimorphism. So I've done a lot of work on, uh, on extinct mowers and, and looked at extinction dynamics and using the genetics to try and track uh, demography of these species through time. I've worked on everything from giant eagles, which is kind of very middle earthy, um, and they used to attack these giant birds. Uh, this guy's related to the smallest eagle in the world from Australia, the um, um, Heratus pinatus. Um, so I got to New Zealand and got really, really, really big really quickly and we're actually working on the whole genome of this, of this guy at the moment. So some new, fascinating examples um, from New Zealand that you guys probably don't care because you're all Australian. <laughs> but then 12 years ago, um, the kind of field of ancient DNA kind of changed dramatically. The whole area of, um, of, of, uh, um, the whole area of genetics changed rapidly when this machine came along. Um, and um, I'm not going to um, talk to too, too much about um, uh, genetics and biochemistry, it's a machine that goes ping and can sequence lots of DNA really, really fast, right? And it's very good at sequencing lots of short bits of DNA. So, you know, the idea of putting together an, a, a genome from an extinct organism was a pipe dream um, 10 years ago. People were just going, it's not possible. We just can't sequence enough of the DNA to put this billion piece jigsaw puzzle together. But this came along and to give you an idea of the scope of change, you know, your, your human genome, or the first human genome, took 10 years to complete and cost $4 billion. Now you can do it in about a day for $1,000. So it's like someone took away our Morse code machine and gave us a supercomputer overnight. So armed with this, the field of paleogenomics kind of got, got arisen, and then we started sequencing lots of cool extinct animals, such as mammoths and Neanderthals. <laughs> um, and we could piece together their entire genomes for the first time, which is really cool, and it can tell us lots of cool stuff about that. Anyway, so just a couple of examples, give you a little bit of taste of what we're working on. We work on the elephant birds. These are from um, Madagascar. West Australian Museum has got a couple of eggs in the collection here. Maybe you can have a look at that when you do the tour. And they allegedly floated across here from Madagascar. 
it landed on kind of Cottesloe Beach and there's a great picture of some kids finding it and I think they're in the collection somewhere. Sorry? <laughs> not, not the kids. No, hopefully not the kids. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 sell, they, sell it, uh, they sell it auction for about $100,000 now, so maybe you probably shortchange them when you put it into the collection. I don't know. Um, um, so, you know, we've been working about getting DNA out of eggshell, which is a, a something our lab's been working on for the last decade on, on extinct mowers and um, uh, as well as elephant birds. And you can see this picture of a beach here in the background, all these bits of eggshell scattered on it working together with Gif Miller quite a lot, who spent a bit of time here getting lots of cool information out of, out of eggshell because these are really neat for doing um, environmental um, work. And up here shows the scale. This is a hummingbird egg, the smallest egg, and the biggest egg to ever exist. So I had a great student, Alicia Greeley, work on, on that and putting together this billion piece jigsaw puzzle. Each one of these black dots here represents a little piece of DNA that we've sequenced out of it. We can put entire ge mitochondrial genomes and whole genomes together <coughs> using these approaches. And then we can kind of put them into nice family trees to show um, what they're related to. So the elephant bird is most closely related to the Kiwi and it's split about, um, it's split about 60 million years ago. And there's some cool sort of biogeography we can do and understand rafting and kind of what we're missing out by not having lots of fossils for Antarctica. Sorry? One minute. One minute. Wow, gee, there's been a time warp, hasn't there? <laughs> All right, so we can also get DNA out of dirt, which we're doing a lot of, um, to finding out lots of stuff about uh, what's um, in the environment, lots of animals and plants, and how it changes through time. And the last project I'd like to talk about is the work that uh, we've been doing down in the Southwest Caves and a few other sites, and that is getting DNA out of um, what we refer to as bulk bone. This is where we take a big pile of bones that hopefully none of the paleontologists actually want, because um, um, they're kind of subcranial or highly fractured and we pull them all together and, and put them into a big pile of, of, of bone powder and we do this so we don't have to do ancient DNA on every single one of these bone powders which will send us broke. So what we'll do when we powder all that material out and ask him what can we use all this scrap material that no one really wants um, is that we, we, we extract DNA from this and we can look at the assemblages and how they change through time. And we've applied this in lots of places around the globe now um, this is from Madagascar, these are little types of fish bones, and these are kind of some of the fish that pop out, which are really hard to ID off that. Um, this is a pile of uh, midden material from New Zealand, uh, and that's all the resulting um, material that was in that pile of bone, lots of cool, cool stuff. We find lots of fish, of course, in here. These are the first examples of IDing whale material from there, because you can't, I guess when you find a whale, you can't um, drag it back to your campsite, you tend to cut it up into small pieces. So there's some really nice archaeological and paleontological insights from this sort of approaches. And this is one of the students, Dan Wenderley, in, in Texas a couple of years ago now, and we've been doing lots of bulk bone material from Texas as well, finding saber-toothed cats, camels, bears, um, and lots of neat taxa. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge, yeah, all these people whose data I've just talked about. So thank you.